Case number one, Flight 19, Mission to Oblivion. Flight 19 was a squadron of five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers that disappeared off the eastern Florida coast on December 5, 1945. It was a puzzle to the United States Navy. One of the greatest manhunts at sea since the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. A PBM flying boat also mysteriously vanished during the Navy's rescue mission. Altogether, 27 crew members. That includes the 14 airmen and 13 from the rescuing mariner were never heard from again. No one could figure out why. The story itself begins at the Naval Air Station at Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The world had just gotten over the horrors of the Second World War and the United States Navy was gearing down to a post-war peacetime force not too aware of the Cold War era ahead of them. Flight 19 was to be a simple assignment. Called Navigation Problem Number 1, it was supposed to be a combination of bombing and navigational situations that were to take most of their flight day. No one, not the members of the flight team, nor those stationed at the Naval Air Base had the slightest inkling of disaster. After all, an excellent commanding officer was instructing Flight 19. The flight leader was Navy Lieutenant Charles Carroll Taylor. Taylor was a well-trained pilot with over 2,500 hours in the air, all on the type of aircraft that he had flown that fateful day. His pupils, albeit not as experienced as he had been, held amongst them over 300 hours in the air, 60 flight hours on the Avenger alone. All of the pilots involved knew and had flown within these waters, having completed several training missions successfully. The remaining pilots of Flight 19 were U.S. Marine Captain Edward Joseph Powers, U.S. Marine Captain George William Stivers, U.S. Marine Second Lieutenant Forrest James Gerber, and U.S. Navy Ensign Joseph Tipton Bosey. Each Avenger had been thoroughly inspected, fueled, and passed with flying colors. All points of safety were double-checked and recorded with one small exception. All five planes were missing clocks. This last was looked upon as unimportant because the mission itself relied solely upon the pilot's skill to navigate and estimate distance by using actual time. And all the pilots wore their own watches. For some unknown reason, Taylor tried to request off the flight due to personal issues. Barring sickbay, the commanding officer of the base could never allow such a group of fighters to leave without an experienced pilot such as Taylor. So, regretfully, Taylor agreed to stay on the flight. To this day, no one has a record of what was exactly bothering Lieutenant Taylor. Another reason for Taylor's denial of release was because a fellow Flight 19 crewman was already bumped from the flight. This was the limit of a flight crew during a day. Marine Corporal Alan Cosnar had been the fortunate airman bumped from the cursed squadron. To this day, no one knows or is there recorded a name of the man who replaced him. Flight 19 had been cleared to leave the naval base at 1345 local time during air and sea conditions recorded as favorable, sea state moderate to rough. The flight was late to depart, taking off at 14.10. As planned, Taylor supervised the trip, allowing a pilot trainee to have the role as leader out front. The mission, navigation problem number one, was to involve the squadron into four legs of their flight. In actuality, Flight 19 flew only three of these. After taking off, they all flew on a heading of 091, almost due east for 56 miles until they reached Hen and Chicken Shoals. For nearly 67 miles after the attack, the team of planes continued onward in an easterly direction, turning to a course of 346 for another 73 miles. On this course, Flight 19 was to fly over Grand Bahama Island. The third and fatal leg of the mission turned the group of Avengers on a course of 241, in which they were to fly a combined distance of 120 miles, at the end of which they would turn left, returning to the Naval Air Station, Fort Lauderdale. Simple enough. 
Naval records of the time do suggest that Flight 19's bombing runs did go ahead successfully. The reason they know this is because Radio Conversations recorded notates that a pilot from the group had called in about 1500 requesting permission to drop his last bomb. Forty minutes later, flight instructor Lieutenant Robert F. Fox, leader of another training flight in the area, received an unidentified transmission, presumably from Flight 19. From Lieutenant Fox's briefing afterward, a student from Flight 19 had requested from Captain Powers a reading on his compass. Powers replied, I don't know where we are. We must have gotten lost after that last turn. Concerned, Fox tried his best to contact the pilots of the air group. Calling Captain Powers, Fox stated, This is FT-74, plane or boat calling Powers. Please identify yourself so someone can help you. There came no response at first. Then, one by one, the pilots of Flight 19 talked amongst themselves, debating whether or not they should respond. Almost losing hope of offering help, Fox received a transmission using the call sign FT-28. This was from the flight leader, Taylor. Eagerly, Fox did his best to provide assistance. FT-28, this is FT-74. What is your trouble? Over. Both my compasses are out, Taylor replied. And I'm having trouble trying to find Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I am over land, but it's broken. I am sure I'm in the Keys, but don't know where or how far down. I don't know how to get to Fort Lauderdale. Fox, following naval regulations, informed NAS that their planes were officially lost, that he was trying to communicate with the flight leader, hoping to aid them back to base. Fox indicated that he suggested to Taylor that he put the sun to his port wing and fly north up the coast of Florida. Given time, Fort Lauderdale would be in sight. Fort Lauderdale had instructed Fox to inquire if Flight 19 was equipped with IFF transmitters. This was so that the ground forces could triangulate the flight, discovering their actual position and thereby talking them all back home. Later, Taylor would offhand admit that his transmitter was activated. Taylor seemed to do everything wrong. At 1645, he transmitted, We are heading 030 degrees for 45 minutes. Then we will fly north to make sure we are not over the Gulf of Mexico. Taylor was immediately commanded to transfer his broadcast to 4805 kilocycles. He never followed these orders. Later, NAS asked him to move to 3000 kilocycles. Taylor replied, I cannot switch frequencies. I must keep my planes intact. At 1646, there were slight clues that confidence in the flight leader by the other Flight 19 pilots was starting to break down. Change course to 090 degrees for 10 minutes, Taylor had ordered. If we could just fly west, we could get home. Head west, damn it. Another pilot, unidentified, was heard saying. Regardless of their questioning of authority, Flight 19 stayed together. One would have to ask, why? Flight 19 had other factors to consider, fuel and the weather. NAS had estimated as the climatic conditions began to worsen that the unfortunate group of planes were more than 200 miles east of the Florida Peninsula. It was at this time while trying to gather up enough of a rescue force to help aid Flight 19 that the equally unlucky PBM-5 aircraft had been called out to find and help them. After transmitting once to the base, the Mariner aircraft was never heard from again. We'll fly 270 degrees west until landfall or running out of gas, Taylor had been heard to say. He requested a weather check. Land-based radios had triangulated Flight 19, the only time it had, around a hundred mile radius of 29 degrees north and 79 degrees west. Flight 19 was nowhere near Florida, but north of the Bahamas, well off the coast. Amazingly, no one thought to transmit this vital information to Taylor. At 1804, NAS received some of the last transmissions from the doomed group of Avengers. Holding 270, we didn't fly far enough east. We may as well just turn around and fly east again. The weather got worse as the radio operators listened. All planes close up tight. We have to ditch unless landfall. When the first plane drops below 10 gallons, 
We all go down together. A British flag tanker, the SS Empire Viscount, had reported that she was heading into heavy seas and high winds northeast of the Bahamas at or around 1804, right on the estimated spot of Flight 19's disappearance. There is one last transmission said to have come from an independent ham radio operator. Another naval aviator had tried to help Taylor hours after his last communication. When requesting Flight 19's position so that the pilot could join them, Taylor issued a stern warning. Do not, I repeat, do not engage. They, they appear, they seem to be from outer space. This last transmission, however, cannot be confirmed by the United States Navy. After an extensive military investigation involving the largest air and sea rescue team ever assembled off the coast of Florida, all the Navy could say was, We are not able to even make a good guess as to what happened. One could chalk up the whole event as a sad case of human error. However, keep in mind, these were highly trained men working within an organization that had been fighting a terrible war for over four years. These were not the type of men to simply get lost. They knew the area and the seas of which they had been practicing within. Then there's that last transmission. Could it have been possible that Flight 19 had been victims of a cat and mouse game involving an alien intelligence sent out to study the readiness of the military? Could there have been forces involved here that we may never understand? One thing is for certain, Flight 19 is still one of the most famous disappearances to happen yet within the waters of the Bermuda Triangle. This has been Stranger Than Fiction Case number one, Flight 19, Mission to Oblivion. If you are interested in reading some of my other works, please go to my website, donaldallenkirch.com. Thank you.